So this isn't quite the crop tour day that I had planned, but I think we'll make this work. Uh, so I want to thank Dom Isaki with OSU Extension Soil Scientists from Pendleton calling in on this call to provide some of his canola expertise. And again, my name is Jacob Powell. I'm with OSU Extension Service as a general agricultural extension agent for Sherman and Wasco County. Jump over to a 10 minute video here of myself actually out in the field with the canola. This was taken on May 8th. This morning we're out this beautiful field of canola that's in bloom as you can see all the yellow flowers behind me. Uh, this field is being grown by Charlie Remington in Wasco County. And to begin with, I'd like to thank Charlie for allowing us to come out here and take a look at his field. I also want to say thanks to Dom Isaki, soil scientist and extension agent for OSU Extension Service based out of Pendleton. He shared a lot of his experience and expertise with canola with me, and I greatly appreciate that. So this field was planted in mid-September, and it was seeded at a rate of 3.5 pounds to the acre using a flux coil hoe drill with a row spacing of 12 to 15 inches. Currently this, this field has probably got maybe another couple days, maybe a week left of flower and then those flowers will then seal shut and go to seed. And when that occurs, basically they will transform form into pods that will end up being about the length of a finger and about the width of a finger as well. So here you can see a very little pod that's starting to develop. These pods will get much larger and will then contain about 20 to 40 seeds in each of these pods. And each of those little seeds, they're about two millimeters in diameter, they're extremely small. But each of those, when this gets harvested, those pods then that are popped open, the seeds come out and the seeds are crushed for canola oil that is then used for cooking and food processing. So it's very interesting with canola oil, it originally came from the rapeseed oil, a rapeseed plant, and uh, that oil, historically, it's been around for thousands of years. Rapeseed oil was actually used in the medieval ages to power lamps, and then during World War II, it was used as a marine lubricant. And so, it, rapeseed oil kind of then became in the mainstream for food when canola was, was derived from it. The problem with rapeseed oil is it had a rustic acid, which they had done tests that showed that it, it caused major cardiovascular issues and health problems with uh, laboratory animals that they had done tests on and it also had a very bitter cabbage like taste to it. And so scientists then were able to develop canola oil in the 1950s and 1960s that did not contain that rustic acid and then was, was edible. And actually canola oil is one of the more health, healthier cooking oils you can use. It's only 6% saturated fat and it also has a lot of phyto, phytosterols, which actually help to lower cholesterol in the human body. So it's very healthy cooking oil to use. And the name rapeseed sounds like it has a bad connotation to it, but actually uh, the rape and rapeseed stands for rapium in Latin, and rapium means turnip. And so canola is actually from the rapium or turnip family. So within that family you have uh, cabbage, kale, broccoli, several other uh, plants we've domesticated for human consumption over the last you know, hundred to thousands of years. Uh, key consideration you have to think about with canola is that it has a very different uh, fertility program than wheat. That primarily comes from the tremendous uh, taproot that the canola plant has. The taproot can go down to six feet and extract nutrients pretty far down in the soil profile, though compaction can be an issue with that at times. And because of this, that taproot system is extremely sensitive to any ammonium or urea fertilizers that you would typically use in a winter wheat crop. And so because of that toxicity and uh, poor interaction that occurs, fertility typically has to be stream applied and typically a split application that you would do one in the fall after you had planted this in mid-September, which mid-September is the suggested time frame to think about planting this in the Pacific Northwest. And you you're open that you have a stand that starts establishing fairly quick there. And the key struggle there with canola is that stand establishment is one of the hardest things with growing this. Obviously in this dry rainfall region that can be a challenge at times. And so with our fertility, again you cannot side band anhydrous ammonia into this so you have to stream it, stream it on using a stream, streamer application. 
and as for application, typically it's nitrogen, but it's also sulfur, boron, and zinc are also applied through those streamer treatments. And so you might be wondering, well, what is a streamer application? So basically what that is, is instead of using your typical spray nozzles on your applicator equipment for herbicide, you kind of have a larger nozzle size that it's not necessarily directly spraying it directly into the plant like you'd want for weed coverage, but it's more kind of streaming it on to both the plant and the surrounding soil, but then it can be uh, uptaken through the plant roots and uh, foliar through the plant as well. This field was also seeded on September 15th with a seeding rate of about 3.5 pounds to the acre. Seeded in with a foxy oil hoe drill. As you can see, no, I have another good stand established here. A uh, similar fertility as the other field in that we had nitrogen and some other nutrients that were applied and streamed on in the fall. And then another application was applied in March as well on this field. Flowers here are actually more in bloom still than another field that Charlie has. You can see that some of these pods are starting to uh, develop fairly large on some of these. So we've talked a lot about fertility and, and getting a standard established. But think about the next step. You know, what's our yield can you expect with a canola field? And there's kind of a rule of thumb that typically you expect to get an 80% yield as you would with a winter wheat crop on the same ground. So we've touched on some other good benefits of canola that growing it, you can use some other grassier herbicides that can help clean up weedy messes you might have in your wheat fields by putting canola in. Similarly, the root structure and just by simply alternating a different crop into the rotation, people have found that they have decreased incidences of wheat diseases such as take all. Here we have another beautiful field of canola that's being grown by David Brewer in Wasco County. I would like to thank David for allowing us to come out here and take a look at the field that he's been growing here. David seeded this in on September 10th and 15th using a JD1985 disc drill. And he uses used the variety Mercedes in this field behind us here. He then used a streamer application to apply fertility on this crop in middle of November, applying sulfur, nitrogen, boron, and zinc. And then again, David applied another streamer application on March 13th prior to this plant bolting. So like I discussed earlier with canola it's really key that you put that nitrogen source there when the plant needs it the most and so that's going to be right before it goes to bolt and so when it's still at that rosette stage in uh, early spring or late winter you want to apply that nitrogen on right before the plant bolts out so that the nitrogen is there available. As I said, it takes about 85% of the nitrogen use occurs when that plant is bolting. So you can see now the plant is in flower behind us, probably will stay like this for maybe another week or so. After that, then those flowers will go to seed and then you'll have those big seed pods that should have 20 to 40 seeds on each of those pods. And so with canola, the nitrogen placement is different than winter wheat due to its root sensitivity to urea and ammonia. The other thing that's different with canola versus winter wheat is that when it comes to nitrogen, there's a much higher nitrogen use efficiency than winter wheat. That the, the plant takes more up than winter wheat, but it puts more nitrogen back in the soil from its residue than a winter wheat crop would. And so it actually has a better uh, nitrogen use efficiency than some of the other crops we could use here. So this field looks beautiful behind us, but you know why else would you want to try to grow canola? And so it's really key to think about that, that now we have a, a broadleaf brassica type plant that we're growing, so that enables you to use other grassy specific herbicides that you might not be able to use on a wheat crop. Hello there again. We're at this beautiful canola field located here above Lyle. James Amory owns this field and we appreciate him letting us come out and take a look at it this afternoon. So this was actually seeded in April of 2019. So this plant has had roots growing in the ground for the last year. And a lot of growers might wonder, well, gee, why would you want to plant this a full year ago? And the key is with canola establishment, you want to have good moisture available for the plant to get a stand established. And so by planting in the spring, when there's typically more abundant precipitation, you're improving the chances of getting good stand establishment. 
and various studies have shown that canola can be seeded fairly early and uh, since it has a rosette that it initially forms that rosette is able to carry the plant through the rest of the year into the fall and over the winter and then when growing conditions align it starts bolting again in the springtime and the next you know it's flowering like it is right now. Uh, this is seeded in with the HD hoe drill. Fertility has been added to this uh, this last spring that was streamed on. And this canola is a variety that is called Eddie Max. And it's one of the canola varieties that is actually a clear field ready variety. And uh, most producers aren't going to be using Beyond Chemistry on their canola, but if you've been using winter wheat that you've been using Beyond on, it's great to use this clear field variety that will not have any issues with any residues that are left in the, in the soils from using Beyond. So the next couple slides I have are just some photos that I've taken of the fields that I then went and visited in the video. And so this is one field that Charlie Remington is growing canola in with the um, Claremore variety. And so you can see this is a picture in February. That canola crop is in the rosette stage, so that's why it looks extremely small there. But then you jump to March, and at that same location you see the plants that are still in the rosette, but they're definitely gaining size. And then when I was out there on May 8th filming the videos, you can see now it's in, in flower and in his bolting, bolting up right. I look at the same field here as in March, and then fast forwarding to May, you can see just how much growth the crop has done there. Similarly, this is a crop that David Brewer is growing canola with the Mercedes variety. And again, here we are in February. Fast forward to March. And then amazing how well developed that is. So you get some good insects here. Canola is a good pollinator crop that actually has flowers that bees can pollinate. Uh, technically, the crop does not need pollination to go to seed, but studies have suggested that having pollinators available can definitely improve the success rate of the crop. So again, this photo is just showing that when those seeds develop, unless they go to seed, you basically get these large seed pods here that those seeds then are inside of. It's another closer look up here. So this is kind of concludes the, the virtual part of really trying to show what was out there in the field right now. And now I'm gonna switch this over to Don Isaki and he's gonna share his expertise on some pest management strategies to use on canola crops. So let me end the share here and send it over to Don. And thank you, Jacob. Uh, I think I'll stop here and see if people have any questions uh, about anything you showed or uh, just something you talked about if people have questions right now. And just just as some general thoughts here, uh, insects are a problem on canola and also have some information on, on disease. Uh, sometimes uh, that may pose some risk, but doesn't pose as much risk as insects. Uh, if you're growing canola, uh, scouting is important. Uh, I've listed about four insects here that uh, are the major pests of canola and, and other brassica crops. Uh, if, you have, if you grow yellow mustard, some of these same insects affect yellow mustard. Uh, flea beetles, aphids, cabbage seed pod weevil, and, and diamondback moth. Uh, some other critters that you'll see out there uh, that are can injure canola, ligus bug, and uh, kind of a unique one is, is blister beetle. Um, some of it, I'm going to go through these sort of in the um, um, time frame that they occur. Uh, this is a flea beetle, uh, primarily a, a problem with uh, seedling canola. Uh, this flea beetle is, is uh, it's less than the sixteenth of an inch long, so it's, it's pretty small. Uh, 
This is a yellow mustard plant. And if you look really close on here, you see some of the little uh, shiny little black flea beetles. Uh, I took this photograph uh, last Friday. This is yellow mustard uh, growing in a trial at, at the station. Uh, and it, it happens to be uh, infested with flea beetles because uh, the uh, stand is really uh, sparse and uh, these plants are a host. And so the flea beetles are attacking these uh, few plants that are there. Uh, another uh, image you can see in the center of this, two little black specks, those are the flea beetles. Um, this is a, a, a close-up photograph of a flea beetle. Uh, when you scout for these things, they, uh, they have a hiding behavior and they also have a behavior of dropping off the plant. So uh, when you're looking for these uh, movement or if you touch the plant, often they'll just disappear by dropping off. So uh, you have to be aware of that when you're trying to find these. Uh, there's a good publication on uh, flea beetles that put out by North Dakota. Uh, and so if you look this up, um, you can find quite a bit of information about flea beetles. Uh, the, uh, the life cycle of the of these critters, uh, they overwinter as an adult. And here in the top center, uh, they come out and feed in the the spring, and when we have canola as a seedling, or you know, sometimes in the fall you see the same thing. Um, and they go through this life cycle of uh, the the egg and the larva. Uh, the, they reside in the soil. It's the adults that come out and feed on the crop. Because uh, flea beetles are mostly a seedling disease, um, Canola Council of Canada has some information about looking at injury on canola. And the injury are these little shot holes that you see in these photographs and um, a treatment level is around 30, 20 to 30% uh, of the cotyledons uh, have shot hole kind of thing. Uh, generally, uh, seed treatments uh, can take care of this for a while. Uh, if the pest outlives the seed treatment, uh, then uh, it might be necessary to, to treat to treat flea beetles. But generally, we don't uh, we let the seed treatment do that. Uh, seed treatments, um, Helix is common uh, insecticide that's applied to to uh, canola. And Gaucho is registered, and then this Forenza is also registered. I don't, I don't have the nominal cost of these, but uh, generally uh, you see Helix applied to canola seed. Uh, there's some other products uh, that are out there. Uh, and so the Medicopric products, just like Gaucho, uh, as seed treatments to control flea beetles and uh, also has some control on wireworms. So if you have wireworm issues, uh, you might get some incidental control. Uh, any, any questions on the flea beetle? Okay, now. Hearing now, I'm gonna move on. Uh, cabbage seed pod weevil, this is the uh, biggest economic uh, pest of canola, cabbage seed pod weevil. Uh, WSU has a cabbage seed pod weevil 
management guide on canola. Uh, so some of this information I'm talking about is in this guide. Uh, this is the adult cabbage seed pod weevil. Uh, they're about a uh, you know, 16th of an inch in size. They also have a high, hiding behavior. Uh, so they, they will tend to drop off of, of the plant when people approach. So you, you've got to be kind of careful how you stop for these things. Uh, the, the life cycle of a uh, seed pod weevil is uh, the adults will come out and feed uh, just as the plants are starting to bloom. And the adults aren't doing a lot of damage feeding, but they are up on the head by the flower uh, feeding, and they will. Um, when the pods appear, the females will lay an egg in the pod, and it looks like a, a tiny little pinprick. Um, you can see them, but you have to look really, really close uh, to see the, that uh, over position of the egg in the pod. And then the larva will hatch in the pod itself, and um, they will feed on the seed. So, whoop, I'm going the wrong way, excuse me. There's a seed pod weevil. Uh, this is the, the larva in the pod. Um, when they hatch out, they move down the pod and eat the seed. And it looks something like that. Uh, they can destroy, one larva will uh, destroy well, half of the seed in the pod. So if you, if you get two, two seeds or two eggs per pod, uh, and it pretty much wipes out the pod. And what you'll see uh, when that larva uh, matures, it will chew a hole, an exit hole in the pod and leave. And that is one of the things that you know is easier to see uh, is this exit hole. Uh, when you see this, you know it's too late to do anything because they've done their damage and they drop back to the ground and they're going to pupate and become an adult. So the, these are not the egg uh, stings. Those are nearly as apparent as this. I mean, you have to kind of know what you're looking for for an egg sting. Uh, but these exit holes uh, are, are apparent. I'm just going the wrong way. This is a little more close up of the exit hole. And then we come to scouting for these critters. Uh, Really, the best way to scout for these are is to use a sweep net and uh, ten sweeps of 180 degrees. So it's a back and forth motion, and you have to be pretty aggressive. Um, and 20 or more adults is is the is the threshold for a spray application. Um, and that's the one that um, WSU is recommended. Uh, and, and I think that's a good threshold. Uh, the time to do this is, you know, early bloom. So at, at early bloom and to the time that you have about one inch long pods, the first early pods are an inch long. And I think in, in my thought process, a pod an inch long is about the time you can start, uh, the females can start depositing eggs. So that's about the trigger time to decide, to determine you're going to do a spray application. So if you reach that threshold and the pods are about an, an inch long, the first pods, then uh, would be a, a spray application. 
Uh, and I'll, I'll say some things about uh, insecticides uh, when, I, when I cover these insects. Any, any questions about the seed pod weevil? Is everybody still with me? Yeah, it's going good, Don. Some good information here still. <laughs> okay, because it's dead silence. I'm not sure. So, uh, the next thing that kind of appears, in a, and there's some overlap between aphids and seed pod weevils, but aphids will appear, uh, they often appear like this, in clusters. Uh, on, a, on a single head, they appear uh, generally from the outside of the field. So as you drive by, you can start to see these aphid colonies on the edge of the field, and then they move into the center. Uh, these are uh, cabbage aphids. A lot of times they'll in, in, infest the, the top head of the, of the canola plant. Uh, so you look right where the the bud is, and you start to see a few aphids, and then uh, that colony will increase in size. Uh, or you can have several heads with just a few aphids on top. And then, that's a, the cabbage aphid here, a couple of different views. Uh, you know, here's a, a flowering bud, and you know, you just start, start to see aphids. Uh, in, in this head. Um, there are some thresholds for aphids. And, uh, generally, if you if you treat for, for set cabbage seed pod weevil, which is the, I guess, the most fearsome pest, you will get incidental control of, of aphids. Uh, if you decide, you know, you don't have cabbage seed pod weevil, uh, threshold levels and so you can hold off and see what the aphid population might be and you may reach a threshold level for treating but uh, the one thing with aphids um, they do infest inside of the field so you can do a, like an outside uh, perimeter uh, application and, uh, and control aphids if they haven't moved into the field. Next pass, uh, diamondback moth. Uh, this is an adult. Um, these are not what damaged the crop, but uh, you know they do have a couple of generations in here, so you may see adults. Uh, the life cycle is is this. Um, so adults will hatch. They will you know, on the left hand side here. They will deposit a, an egg on the other side of the leaf, and then the larva hatches out. And it's the, the larva that does uh, the chewing damage on the crop. Uh, and here you have a couple uh, generations uh, through the season. So there's an early generation and a later generation. So uh, they can affect both spring and winter canola because there's more than one generation per season. Uh, here's an egg on the other side of the leaf. Uh, larva on the right. Uh, these larvae when they first appear are probably less than a centimeter long. Uh, as they mature and go through the end star stages, the, you'll see these up to uh, like an inch or uh, three centimeters in length. Uh, when that larva pupates, it'll uh, form this pupa on the other side of the leaf. Uh, looks like on the left here, when it's newly formed, and then as they get older, they sort of age. And they look a little bit different. And they lose their green color. Uh, economic threshold, um, there's a couple different crop stages. If we're early in flowering, um, you know, these are pretty high thresholds. 
10 to 15 larva per square foot. Now this is a, you know, it's like a forager eating out there. They got to eat up a lot of the tissue. Uh, so these levels are pretty high. Uh, in the pod stage, they're even higher. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, only a few fields uh, in my career that actually had these thresholds uh, and were treated for just uh, the, the diamondback moth larva. But they can be found uh, pretty often in, in canola fields if you don't reach this kind of level of infection. So uh, questions on, on diamondback moth. Hey, here comes a, an interesting one. Uh, blister beetle. Uh, any, have it, has anybody seen these? Either everybody's muted and doesn't want to talk, or uh, these are uh, like an inch and a half in size or so. Uh, blister beetles, uh, they are not probably an economic pest on canola, uh, but it's sort of a unique pest. If you ever encounter a blister beetle, there's a reason they're called blister beetles. Uh, they're toxic to the touch. So uh, if you see one of these critters, you probably don't want to touch it. Uh, just another view of blister beetles. Uh, I've seen these on canola uh, in a few fields. And generally what they do is they, they infest a few plants along the edge of the field. So if you see these, it's sort of a unique thing, uh, interesting pest but not really a problem, except uh, you don't want to touch them. Lagus bug uh, is another insect. Uh, it's a chewing insect. Uh, you, would, you would scout for this just like you do uh, the, the diamond back moth and the uh, cabbage seed pod wiggle with a sweep net. Uh, I guess bug affects uh, quite a few crops, uh, but it does affect canola. Uh, we we're founding Ligus bug on hemp last year. Uh, it was the only uh, significant pest that I found on the hemp plant. Um, I don't know if they were at economic threshold levels, but it was the one, the one of the few insects that was chewing on our hemp. Uh, they, they have a life cycle of two to three generations per year. And, you know, here's the uh, life cycle. It's about 40 to 60 days. So depending on when that first generation appears, uh, you may have uh, two to three generations to deal with. Uh, again, uh, with this pest, uh, if you're doing a an application for seed pod weevil, if they, they were present, you would control them at that, at that crop stage. Uh, just a uh, closer up view of the lagus bug, uh, pretty common insect. Um, uh, you can see them on wheat, you can see them on potatoes. Uh, so I think most of us probably have seen lagus, lagus bugs. You may not have known what they were called, but uh, now you do. Okay. This is going to cover a few insecticides here. Um, for most of these pests, uh, the active ingredient bifenthrin comes under a number of labels. Uh, it's kind of one of the preferred. Uh, insecticides for controlling uh, pests on canola. Uh, and you note know, here it, it controls uh, aphids and flea beetles. And, uh, 
blister beetle, uh, cabin seed pod weevil, uh, number of pests. So, you know, if you're making an application for like cabin seed pod weevil, you're going to get incidental control uh, on on these other paths. And it, you know, the RUP here is that these are restricted use pesticides. Um, warrior is a, another insecticide that's been used. Uh, the active ingredient is this lamb, lambda by uh, It comes under a bunch of labels, and again, you see uh, you get incidental control with uh, this of, of a number of paths. Okay, I'm going to uh, show you a photograph coming up here. Uh, anybody recognize this path? So either everybody's afraid to answer or... Ladybug larva. Yeah, this is a ladybug larva, so it's not a pet. Uh, so if you see these and you're going to all uh, uh, you can rejoice because uh, they forage on aphids and eat other uh, insects that are there. Uh, how are we doing on time, Jacob? Oh, we've got 10 minutes left. I mean, we should start wrapping up or start answering some questions pretty soon here. Um, if you had, you know, one or two more slides you want to present, you probably still could. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. The, this is kind of the uh, the insect that I was going to cover. Um, the next thing I was going to cover was uh, some of the disease uh, issues. So I, you know, I can end here, or I can throw a few slides on for your diseases. Well, I guess we should maybe just pause here real quick again. You know, anyone have uh, any questions about? canola here. Um, I did just want to cover, somebody had, had asked a question about kind of, you know, I showed basically uh, four different canola fields, you know, what were the differences kind of across those four. And really in terms of seeding rate, everybody kind of used a pretty similar seeding rate. Um, I think it's just interesting how everybody with canola, you can kind of use the setup that you're already preferring to use for your wheat. And so you know, we've got somebody with a flux coil hoe drill, a disc drill, and then a real old school HD drill um, that is being used as well. Probably the biggest difference is just the three fields in Wasco County are pretty close to each other uh, versus the field of James Amory up above Lyle. You know, it's a very different soil type up there, much more clay soils uh, than around the Columbia District in Wasco County. And also just, you know, very different climate as well. He has a lot wetter soils up there um, than we do down here that, you know, those clay soils don't drain quite quite as good. Um, so despite all those differences, you know, all those four canola fields are all kind of looking about at the same stage right now. So. Uh, any other questions, comments? We kind of have a quiet crowd here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say, Don, maybe let's cover, you know, one one of the diseases you were going to cover, and then we can wrap it up. Okay. I'm going to flip over to Square Canyon here. Oh, I had a Square Canyon slide in here. Oh, well. Uh, Sporkinia, uh, white rot. Uh, this is a disease uh, of canola, but it's it's also uh, a disease of a lot of broadleaf weeds and broadleaf crops. Uh, alfalfa can have this. Uh, beans have it. So it, 
it, it, it occurs on, on quite a few broadleaf plants. Um, and the uh, symptom of this is this white stem rod at the base of the plant. And, you know, when you're harvesting or going into maturity, you will find this if you have this particular disease. And it's, it's uh, present in, in a small amount in most fields, but definitely not at a treated level. Uh, if you grow irrigated canola, uh, you may want to think about you know, fungicide application. Uh, the treatment for this is a prophylactic treatment. You apply it at about 20% bloom uh, before you even know you have the problem. So if, if you've experienced this uh, in your irrigated canola, uh, you would treat at about 20% bloom. But you really don't see the problem showing up to maturity. And thing about that, uh, I call this quits here for the uh, Yeah, that's all good information, Don. And I don't know, it's good to hear about some diseases other than just stripe rust in the wheat right now. So Yeah. Well in, in my career, uh with canola, uh, there's probably only once that I, uh, in retrospect, I would have treated for sclerotinia. So, it, you know, if you're raising canola, it's there, especially dryland canola, but it, it's not usually a problem. But if you know what to look for and see this white stem rot, you'll know what it is. And the, there are sclerotia in the stem. So when you cut canola, if you have uh, the white mold in there, those sclerotia will appear in your drain tank and they look like, um, for lack of a better term, rat turds. Yeah, so if, if anyone's grown canola, that's a good point. Keep an eye out in your combine. If you think you have rat turds in there, they might actually be something with the, with the canola that you're harvesting and not, not the rats that are getting in there, so. Uh, uh, appreciate you putting this on, Jacob, and um, I hope everyone is healthy and uh, taking care of themselves. Yeah, this isn't the uh, crop tour we had in mind, but Don was willing to come up when we were going to be having an in-person crop tour. So it was good that we were still able, able to get Don on the call a little bit here and still talk a little bit about canola. And uh, it definitely has some good rotational benefits and promises for weed control in, in winter wheat that just certainly you can use some grassy herbicides that you can't if you had a, a wheat and crop there. And as we deal with some more herbicide resistance issues down the road here, I think using some alternative crops like canola really hold a lot of promise to, to try to help get those fields of wheat out of rotation and, and mix it up a little bit. So 